Councillor Humphreys is scheduled to uh, chair tonight's GC meeting, but she's unable to be here. So as per the procedural bylaw, I'll look to committee to appoint a member to chair the meeting tonight. <laughs> I move, I move Councillor Peary. Councillor Peary has been moved, seconded by Councillor Maracas. Is there any comments or questions to the motion? You accept. You accept your All in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Councillor Peary will chair. everyone thank you very much for uh, everybody showing up uh, first motion will look for an approval of the agenda as um, amended moved by mayor Dahl, seconded by councillor gartner any comments or questions on this seeing none all those in favor that's carried thank you very much do you have a copy of the actual agenda so we'll now have a declaration of pecuniary interests. General nature thereof, seeing none, we'll move on to presentations. There are none on the uh, docket here tonight. Delegations, we do have Austin Clark, Clark here speaking to item number R1. Uh, so Austin, um, we invite you up. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of committee. Um, we'll just ask that you state your name and address as well. Um, Austin Clark from uh, 16 October Lane in Aurora. Um, I'm 22 and I graduated from Durham College for Music Business. Um, after graduating from that college, I secured a full-time job in Richmond Hill um, at the 404 and Elgin Mills, taking a wire T to get there took about an hour and a half, so I purchased my first car, um, which brought the travel to 20 minutes. Um, so with the issue of parking during the winter, um, I have a single driveway, which um, my dad parks in, and then I have my garage, which my mom parks in, so there's nowhere for me to park on my property, so I park on Stone Road. Um, so during the winter when it snows and there's that uh, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. period where uh, there would be snow plowing, I agree that it is necessary for um, plows to come by and clear the roads, but at that time I have nowhere to move my car. Um, so I'd like to propose the idea of during, let's say, even days of the month, um, I would park on the left side of the road and odd days I'd park on the right or um, an idea similar to that which would allow um, the plows to plow either side of the road on every other day and um, that would leave the responsibility up to myself and others affected by this to pay attention to when it's going to snow. Um, thank you for listening and um, I hope you consider my ideas or if you come up with any other ideas that would solve my problem. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions for Mr. Clark? Councillor Abel. So oh, sorry, sorry, Councillor Gartner.
October Lane is that? That's a two two lane street. Is and is there room for parking on one side of the street? There is parking on one side, but it's limited to two three hour parking. Right. So there's there's a lane. There's two lanes. One for traffic going in each direction, yes. and then there's parking. Sorry, there's no there's no parking lane or anything like that. It's just uh, two two way. So you're parking uh, presumably in front of your home and just cars go around? Currently. As they do in residential neighborhoods? Right now I park on Stone Road actually because of that three hour limit on Stone Road um, during the summer and everything like that. There's no uh, time restraint on that. Are you near the schools? What's that, sorry? Are you near the schools? Um, no, not really. Thank you for coming forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks, Austin, for uh, coming and delegating. It's, um, did you have the car last winter? I did. So last winter, when there was a snow event, what did you do because you had to remove your car? Um, I usually had to stay at friends' houses that had an extra spot for me to park in. So in a snow event now, you could do so going forward? I could, but that's um, something that's usually quite difficult and uh, difficult to do with timing and trying to pay attention to when it is going to snow and setting that arrangement up with um, my friends that are available and around. The, uh, this is sort of my last question, I think. The, um, so for the other times when it's not snowing, it would be convenient for you to park there overnight as you do in the summer? Yes. Okay. I, th I think that's... That's fair. Um, it would. It seems to me it would be fair. That's why the the, the bylaw was tried last year. Yeah. But I appreciate your comments. And uh, if you were accommodated last year uh, by temporarily moving it in, you know, I, I don't know how many times you have to do that. Um, but Stone Road is a main artery, so it probably gets primarily plowed quickly before it goes into the secondary streets. Okay. Thanks very much again, Austin, for coming forward. You're welcome. Seeing no other comments or questions, uh, we'll look for a motion to receive and refer to the item. Moved by Mayor Doss, seconded by Councillor Tom. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favour? Any opposed? That is carried. Um, we are, thank you. We are now into the consent uh, agenda portion of the meeting. Um, would anybody like to speak to item number C1? C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, or the added C7. Seeing none, we'll now move on to the regular agenda. Uh, we'll ask for a, a motion first to approve the consent agendas items. Councillor Maracus, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Comments, questions, seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Now we'll move on to the regular agenda items. Uh, and item number R1 um, is the winter parking restrictions. I'll look first for a motion to uh, approve the staff recommendation. Or just to receive for information. Mayor Daw, seconded by Councillor Gartner. Any comments or questions? Councillor, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just with respect to, uh, we've had a couple of, we had one at open forum, we had we just had a delegate on this. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so Mr. Clark specifically referred to the, uh, to an option of um, an even day you should park on the even side of the road or an odd day you should park on the odd side of the road. And I'm just wondering through you if I would, uh, to go to uh, uh, Ms. Mandy, if there is a, I'm sorry, get closer to the microphone here. Uh, is there time sensitivity to excuse me time sensitivity to this uh, and if not could you perhaps uh, just maybe have a look at some of those comments uh, and incorporate them into a, a report so we could defer this back to staff just for uh, ability to uh, to maybe take some of those comments into account and then come back 
Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there is a little bit of time sensitivity on this because of communication issues. We want to make sure that we have a program that's endorsed by council, uh, that we have plenty of time to educate the public on. Uh, so that is the time sensitivity in that. Uh, but we can certainly take all those comments into consideration. I think the whole idea here was to provide the best customer service uh, for the residents while enabling the town to still ensure that the roads are clear. Thank you. Mr. Nader Rosney, would you like to add something? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the uh, one thing I'd add is um, one thing I can think off the top that might be problematic with the alternating days is that uh, on many of our streets, one side there's no parking allowed at all. Hmm. and the other side is allowed parking and so um, you'd have to really look at basically all those cars that be now parking in a, in a complete in an area that's defined by bylaws and no parking zone all the time so I think there's I think there's a lot of technical issues you'd have to almost go street by street and figure out where that where that could work so not that it's impossible but I think it would take some time to figure that out if, as a as a logistical way to handle it it's, it's difficult to be thinking of snow when it's as nice as it is outside thank you Ms. Clare Councillor Abel. Well, um, I, I, I think it's just more of a comment, but and I don't mean any uh, disrespect, but if, if this was something that is uh, needed time for communication, I, I would have suggested we would have brought this matter forward, uh, you know, a couple of months ago. Um, the the policy of um, going back to the overnight due to the snow plowing uh, that would occur on evenings. And, and, and in my mind, it could be snow plowing uh, to start on the primary roads so people could get going in the morning. And it could also be uh, work that can be done very quickly in the evening overnight hours to the secondary roads to catch up, to get behind. So it's for any sort of snow event that falls in there. Um, and I appreciate that the businesses also uh, had some issues with it, but we could identify those streets that uh, have businesses because of all the kilometers in Aurora, and let's say it's a thousand, maybe only 3% have businesses on them. So um, maybe there's a, a way to address that sort of situation. And I would have liked those sort of comments to be included in this report just at first blush because I've sort of been waiting for it. Um, but my question would be that uh, as far as um, moving through secondary streets as last year as you did uh, to make sure that any parked cars that are parked during the day, uh, but during a snow event, is that, is that still going to uh, occur? Ms. Eddie? Through you, Mr. Chair, I think the best person to speak to that would be uh, Mr. Downey. He's um, going to be in charge of, you know, the plowing and keeping the roads clear. So I think he's got a schedule already worked out for that. Um, okay, but I mean, last my, my question is: last year, bylaw worked in tandem with the operations during the day. That if cars were identified on on secondary streets as the plows were coming by that bylaw would focus and then move in uh, with an identified car that was, was uh, hindering in the process. So I guess if Mr. Downey would answer that, that, that's my specific question, Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, depending on what direction council takes, um, we have difficulty getting down some streets with our, with our equipment. Um, and in conversations with, uh, with staff, um, if we can't get down the street, then it won't be plowed. Um, so we need an opportunity to make sure those streets are cleared of cars. Um, and um, if we can't get it down there during the day, then we will do our, our best to do it uh, between two and six uh, when, the car, when the cars would be off the road if this, uh, if this is approved by council. So um, we need an opportunity to have clear streets at some point. Um, and um, the policy you have or the, the report you have before you allows that to happen. So Mr. Downey, my question was is if, if you're plowing during the day and cars were impeding you on secondary roads, uh, would bylaw come and ticket those cars so that you could be able to go clearly down the road? And I think your answer was no. You would come back and do it overnight when we'll just when get mr downey to clarify that through you mr that's correct we so you would come home to an uncleared road um, 
and that's what but I wanted. That's to the consequences of not having cars off the road. Okay, so there would be no consequence for people not removing their car during snow plowing operations during the day. Uh, I'm just, it, it's, it doesn't, you've just said the same. Yeah, through, it, absolutely correct. However, uh, uh, residents may call up and say, I just came home from work and my, my street's not cleared. That's because we couldn't get down the street because there were cars on it. And so we won't be clearing that until two o'clock in the morning when we can actually get down there and clear those streets. So, so there, way, there may be some concerns with regards to that from, um, uh, from a resident's perspective in that they there may be an expectation if it was, if it was snowing and 8 o'clock in the morning and the, uh, we were doing this and then they come back and they see that no action has been taken during the entire day, um, they may, ha may, may have some concern, but so, you wouldn't just, be able just, to get down the road. Just to jump in, Count, Mr. Downey, um, you're only referring to instances where, where individuals are parked legally on the street. And if you are parked illegally on the street, you will receive a ticket. Oh, it, that, that has nothing to do with snow plowing. Okay, sounds good. Councilor Abel? So I'm, my comment is um, you, would ha you would have to come back, which means you would go, you attend the site once and then come back. So your operations is actually going to be working twice on the same route, uh, which is a lack of efficiency in my opinion. And I'm looking at page four of the report, and of the 21 winter events, uh, including snow advisory snow events and extreme snow events, during the first uh, several events, 450 warning tickets were issued, which means there was 450 vehicles interfering with complete, which means that's a big percentage of you coming back overnight to do it. So, I mean, I guess one strategy is not to do it during, I mean, you, you might find that if two out of three streets are, you have to come back for, I mean, that's a possibility. We won't know until this, this gets underway. Uh, but last year, um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up because I can save most of this for, for next week, but um, uh, last year of these events, of all these people that you did issue tickets to during the day uh, represents a fair amount of, uh, of the operation will now uh, be impeded. So were there, when you were issuing tickets and warnings at the beginning, did you find that the incidents near the end was gradually getting Im improved? There would be less? Like, were people getting the message? Through you, Mr. Chair, that wasn't quite our experience. Um, it was difficult for consumers and commuters who were parking during the daytime if we called a snow event uh, for them to remove their vehicles in a timely manner. Um, we did, an, other than the issued warnings, we did a lot of verbal warnings, we did a lot of door-to-door -door knocking, a lot of verbal education, and uh, we didn't seem to be getting uh, any further ahead, quite frankly. Our best, but... There's no stats or anything to show that, like a month by month here? I could pull month by month, but uh, I don't have them here. We just did some totals for you. Okay. I could do Thank that. Thank you. Perhaps if, if you don't mind, you could email it to us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Gertner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking the chair. Um, snow clearing is one of the most important services that we offer the residents. And in my experience, it's certainly the one that, one of the ones that I get the most feedback on, usually when people aren't happy. Um, just for clarification, when I first moved here, I got a ticket on November 30th when I was on the road. But it, it uh, on the street, it seems to me that that's really not the intent. The intent is only when there are snow events to be ticketing cars that are on the street. And is there going to be a communications like last year where people can follow on Twitter, et cetera, to know when those events are going to happen? even though we can't predict 100%? Through you, Mr. Chair, the intention is to communicate uh, when we're going to have blades on the ground. So there is a communication strategy between uh, bylaw and uh, IES. Uh, IES will be activating uh, a link on the website to indicate that they will be uh, plowing. The bylaw 
in reality prohibits between 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. parking. So that's really to set an expectation for uh, drivers and homeowners not to park during that time. However, um, there doesn't seem to be any need at this point to ticket somebody if there's mm -hmm. no blades on the ground Thank or you. there's no winter snow clearing taking place. Thank you. Is it possible that we would allow residents who wanted to to park on their lawns? Through you, Mr. Chair, there's a zoning bylaw that would prohibit that. Um, I think that involves a bigger discussion uh, with other directors. Thank you, and it is there for a good reason, but um, maybe we can rework it so that I don't know if it would be practical for all residents to be able to park on their lawn, depending upon the the, the grade, um, and certainly the grade from the sidewalk, but th that might be a solution. Would you, would you like to answer me? <laughs> I wasn't sure that was a question. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> oh, okay. No, it wasn't a question, but it, it's, a, it's a comment for council to consider because we do have bylaws and they, they serve very practical reasons. But in this case, suspending the bylaw could serve a very practical reason as all well as, thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Uh, three, Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey, the report really speaks to, you know, the two different processes we use to deal with clearing our roads and, and the winter parking restrictions. And, you know, it, it, in the pilot pro program, it talked about last year about the involvement of you know, the various departments, your said IES, bylaw, communications. but. On page uh, five, where it says financial implications, there, it says none. Is there no difference financially between the two methods we've used, or is that something that we just we weren't able to really track last year as we engaged in this pilot process? Mr. Downey. I don't know if I've said this before, but I don't think I'm equipped for that answer. I don't know if I've got the information you need to provide an answer for that. So, um, because I don't know what cost implications were, were involved last year, as you can appreciate. And um, so I wouldn't know where there would be efficiencies or, 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 or additional operating costs as a result of changing it. So I would, I'm not equipped at this point to be able to answer that for you, I apologize. Would it be possible something you could look into and maybe report back next week to see whether or not there's any any financial implications between the two different models? Sorry, through you to Mr. Downey. No, I think that makes it's a fair question. Um, yeah, it's a fair question. I, I I'll do my best. Um, I I because I'm not quite sure what I'm looking at. I I don't know how much work there is to get it done. So. Um, I, I can only do my best and, and see what I can't uh, what I can't accomplish. I would appreciate any sort of uh, you know information you can provide. You know, it's also budget time, and so I'd, I'd be interested to know whether or not there's any financial implication between the two. So that's my question. Thank you, Councillor Marakis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, three to Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey, um, under the pilot program uh, and ticketing during any snow events during the day, did that help? Uh, with the efficiency of the of the snow clearing, Mr. Downey. Through you, Mr. Chair. It's our position that we would love all the cars off the road all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be an ideal world, and I'm realistic enough to know that I don't live in an ideal world. Um, so we are we are looking for and as effective a program as we can. So we know we need the cars off the road, all the cars off, all the roads at some point, and so that's what this plan does. Um, if we could extend that into uh, additional hours, that would be great, um, but I, my problem is I couldn't tell you how many hours that would be and when those would mostly be effective because it really depends on the snow event. Um, and um, uh, if we knew it was always gonna snow and start snowing at, you know, seven o'clock at night and we could get geared up and, you know, w things would be fine, but um, it, it doesn't necessarily go that way. So, so I, I, I believe that this is, this is uh, a good step. The, uh, there's definitely advantages to having the cars off the road during the day, there, no doubt. But there are also issues related to that and we can appreciate that. Um, uh, it's our, it's, it's, 
it's going to be our procedure, our practice, that um, if we aren't, aren't able to clear the road during, during the day, then we're going to come back and we're going to do it during the night when we haven't got the cars on the road. And we're going to see how that works. And there may be additional costs associated with that, but we're hoping that we're, we're going to be able to um, address um, residents' needs as best we can. Uh, and and I, I, I think communications, as the, as the delegate happened to say, is extremely important. We need to make sure that the public are aware. Um, and even if, even if we don't have restrictions on parking, it would be great if you didn't park on the road because that would help out a tremendous amount to us. And I'd like to get that message out because it's to everyone's benefit for us to be able to go down your street and plow your street, regardless of whether there's parking restrictions on it. Council Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Downey. Um, I guess I'll ask you a, a different way. Um, <laughs> uh, by, by, um, by issuing tickets, did that get the cars off the streets? Mr. Downey? So, through you, Mr. Chair, ticketing a car doesn't help. It, uh, because it doesn't remove the car, which is what the issue is. Um, so, um, uh, unless the car is removed, it, it, it doesn't help. What it does is it sets in motion a practice and an understanding and um, um, an expectation uh, by, um, by the municipality on the resident and from the resident that, or to the resident that we are out there to enforce the expectations um, in order to help provide as good a service uh, to you as possible. Um, and if that means that we have to ticket you, then fine. And we're hoping that the message then gets to that resident and we don't see a reoccurrence of that. But, you know, if I'm driving the plow, a ticket on a windshield doesn't help me. Um, but I hope it sends a message so the next time I go down there in the next snow event, that car isn't there. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Downey. I'll say my comments either for a little bit later or for next week. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Well, I'll see if anybody wants to speak for the first time. Seeing none, Councillor Gartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I might be correct in saying that we have a member, a former member of town staff in our audience this evening. <laughs> Welcome. That's it. Oh, that was it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Councillor Abel? No. Nah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So th I, I think that I just want to be clear. There's a couple of questions uh, with the financial impacts. We talked about service impacts. Service impacts during the day will probably diminish because they'll have to repeat and come back. Um, the but will there be uh, that might that might cost us more. But will we also benefit from the ticketing uh, for overnight parking when uh, people are parking and and perhaps. Uh, think oh it's not snowing or there's no snow on the ground so I'll just I'll park here and then get a ticket like as before because we did we did uh, lose a lot of or at least I was led by my impression we lost significant revenue because we removed the parking overnight restrictions last year and it's not in this report that I see That's so funny. that is something I'd like to see how many streets have businesses and customers Offhand, I can only think of Wellington and down Victoria and stuff, but I may be uh, unaware. But most streets, uh, the percentage. So, I mean, if we can identify the handful of streets and we can we can move a, in that direction and uh, come up with a strategy for that. But for everywhere else, why wouldn't we just say no cars during snow events? Um, so Councilor, I would like to know the qu answers to that first question. I'm going to ask that they be brought for next week. I, I don't expect um, that unless you have them available now. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's several questions you've asked there, and I'm trying to make sure to document them so that I, if I don't have the answer tonight, that I'll have it for next week. As far as revenue, um, my, uh, our department, I believe, you know, we're here to make sure this is a safe community, a comfortable community, and um, revenue generation from overnight parking um, is not something that uh, I want to focus on simply for revenue sake. Uh, Mr. Downey made a really clear point about uh, vehicles not uh, 
being moved when they are ticketed, but it does set up a precedent, as he said, uh, for setting an expectation that cars would be moved off the road. Daytime parking on the street, as far as businesses and schools and visitors and all that is concerned, uh, it's extremely difficult to uh, get people to understand that to remove them during the daytime because they're not all from Aurora. Quite often we have a number of visitors to Aurora, um, whether it's school, like I said, or commuters. So the overnight parking, I think, um, when it snows, if we're able to have people understand that when it's snowing, they need to abide by the bylaw and remove their vehicles from the road, it's going to benefit all of the town of Aurora, the residents, and the staff inclusive. As far as the uh, streets that have businesses on them, uh, most of them actually have three hour or one hour parking restrictions on them already. So um, the overnight issue isn't so much of a problem uh, because there are three hour restrictions. And I'm not sure what other questions there were. If you want to uh, make I, sure to email them, the, I can make sure. The first question really was around revenues. I can understand not doing this for revenue's sake, but uh, I think council, to Councillor Abel's point, having those numbers in front of us, if we don't have them in front of us now, just so we can be aware of them at the very least, I think we, is We can is do that. We can do that. Important. Mr. Chair, I was uh, just going on with my questions. I don't mind clarifying them. Okay. If I could have the floor back. I was, I was just asking for two pieces of information. The revenue before uh, we had the overnight and the revenue last year, is there an impact? Because if we're going to be duplicating and increasing operational costs and sacrificing service during the day, I think it's important for council to know the numbers and figures. So if you could just provide the revenue before and after, I'd appreciate that. I did ask you earlier if you had a scale to see if there was any effectiveness, whether this messaging was working. So if you had that by the month, how many tickets you were doing, if we saw a decrease, people were learning. And then the last question I have is, how many streets can we identify as having a business that would be affected with the comments that we got that people and businesses and customers were having issues with it if we were, if we were using uh, a, f a small single percent of the roads that we're talking about, then we could address that and say overall, the majority, overwhelmingly, do not fall into that category. I, didn't, I, I would like to have those parameters sort of giving an evidence-based so we can make that decision, or at least for myself. So those, just those three stats is all I'm asking for. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Tom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I know we had obviously an extensive conversation about this last uh, year, um, whenever it came up at Council. Um, at, one of the things that we talked about during that debate was Ottawa I was t uh, t used as a model, I guess, and, and how they have uh, restrictions in Ottawa. And, and one of the things I guess I didn't realize at the time, and perhaps uh, Mr. Nader Rosny, we discussed this uh, earlier, but uh, perhaps you could confirm, is that Ottawa has three-hour parking restrictions on all their streets. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I won't, I, won't, I won't speak for all their chairs, but uh, all their streets. But uh, certainly, a lot of the big residential areas, the old neighborhoods, and so on, had a three-hour restriction at any time during the day, and uh, and they used that three-hour restriction for winter control. Most definitely, I can tell you as a student who paid many tickets. Right. So, <laughs> and in addition to that, they would try to enforce during a snow event so that they could get the roads clear, even in a case that someone was parked for their three-hour period of time. I know Newmarket has. I mean, again, I think there's a lot of differences in streets, but they have, a, I think, a blanket or a standard three-hour maximum at all times of the year as well. So they probably just don't have to run into this issue. I think the issue we're running into is that, uh, and, and the gentleman who delegated uh, illustrates this, is that, you know, what you have, there's a lot of residents in Aurora that don't have enough parking for their, for, for their house. And they mitigate that in Aurora because we you can park, you know, all night and all day in uh, in the summer. Obviously, this is a problem in the winter. But you know, I, I, when I was growing up, that this is just the way it was, and so everyone kind of dealt with it. So I think the challenge of of, of not enough parking is not going to be solved by um, by alleviating the winter restrictions from two to six. You're just going to shift that burden to a different time of day, and maybe most people would be at work. But unless you maybe you work shift work and you have to park on your street when you're sleeping during the day, and then you're going to get a ticket anyways. And so. Uh, I think we should 
calibrate our winter parking uh, restrictions to facilitate plowing the best that possibly can be done. And it seemed as though the best time to do that is to have a, the way it used to be, which is you have uh, 2 a.m. To, to, to 6 a.m. in the morning, and you know if it snows at 8 a.m., uh, you know that yes, you're gonna, your street might not get plowed until that evening, but the way it was last year, there was no guarantee it was gonna be plowed in a good period of time anyways, because if you were parked on the street and ticketed, you couldn't run the plow down the road. I'm, I understand and, and um, was sympathetic to um, a lot of the residents who came forward looking for this um, change last year and were supportive of the pilot project because I think, you know, there's a very variety of reasons why you would like to have your car parked on the street overnight, but I think when you look at how it played out last year and, you know, versus how we've done things in the past, I just think the most concise way to get the streets plowed and the easiest way for residents to understand when they can or can't park on the street is just to revert back to the way we did it before, in my opinion. Um, I'd be happy to look at more, you know, information if there's some revenue information that's going to come from staff or, you know, some more detailed information on last year's uh, pilot project. I mean, if, it, if, if you could show that there was more tickets at night during snow events uh, versus during the day, I mean, it's kind of hard because, you know, some winters might snow every night and not, never want snow during the day or vice versa. So, I mean, it's hard to kind of extrapolate that data to give you any sort of consistency, but uh, more information is, is, is good. And so if by next week, if there's a bit more information that can fill this picture out a bit more, that's great. But, it, you know, from my opinion, I think, you know, the staff recommendation to, I guess, receive this report and, and revert back to our previous practices is something that I'll probably be in favor of at this point. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers on the list, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. We'll move on to item number R2. Space. Oh, you want to move four forward? Um, is there a seconder to move item number R4 forward, seconded by Councillor Gartner? Comments or questions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. So R4 is the draft plan of condominium. Um, I'll look for a mover for this. Moved by Mayor Daw, the staff recommendation. Any seconders? Seconded by Councillor Thompson. Um, comments or questions on item number four? Councillor Gartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple of questions uh, from page six. Um, proposed trail system, last line. The proposed trail system may in the future provide access to the neighborhood to the west. Uh, oh, well, via an underpass. Um, where, where is that coming from? I mean, where is this information coming from? Through. I, I believe uh, Mr. Ramuno looks prepared to answer that question. Certainly through you, Mr. Chair. I mean, we've had discussions um, throughout the years, and I think it's identified in our trail plan, but I'll turn that over to uh, Mr. Downey with respect to trying to secure that trail uh, w w west to the community under the, uh, the tracks. And we, we've made that comment to uh, Metrolinx as well. Thank you. I, I do remember that, but is, I mean, really, is there hope? Mr. Downey seems to want to answer that Mr. question. Mr. Downey. <laughs> you, Mr. Chair, there's no hope if we don't ask. So um, we so. are definitely pushing forward. Council's giving us, uh, has approved a trails master plan, which indicates a, an underpass. And we are doing our very best to fulfill that recommendation. I hope you succeed. Uh, my next question actually is for Mr. Downey as well. It's um, talking about... Uh, Compensation plantings, and do we make an effort to do uh, native species when we ask for compensation plantings? Mr. Downey. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, we have a list of uh, plant material that we would like to see uh, planted. 
um, with those compensation plantings. And yes, there are native plant material uh, within that. Uh, it's not exclusively native plant material. It, uh, it also depends on the soil conditions and the type of environment that those trees will be growing in. But uh, yes, native plants are on that list. Thank you. And my last question is about a blockchain link fence. Uh, it's proposed along the rear of all lots on the private open space or public environmental protection lands. And th the height is 1.2 meters, which is just under four feet. Um, I think if it's environmental protection lands, we should be putting a higher fence there, there through you, Mr. Chair, either Mr. Downey or Mr. Muno. A four-foot fence isn't, if the idea is to protect those lands, a four-foot fence isn't going to do it, in my opinion. Mr. Downey. Through um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, we have an objection to a 1.2. We have no objection to go to a 1.5. Our main concern is that we have a fence. Um, and because that fence helps delineate that uh, that property boundary um, and, um, um, and and ensure or encourage that there's no encroachment from that onto those onto those lands um, we don't find that that uh, the height of the fence is necessarily of a concern uh, the absence of a fence is a greater concern so um, uh, we believe 1.2 is sufficient in order to at least give us um, that assurance that they understand where the property boundary is and there is no access to uh, to those public lands uh, from an encroachment perspective. Thank you Mr. Danny. I personally and I think it's prudent uh, if we're trying to protect those lands that we choose a higher fence for that and I'm uh, I'm thinking the developer would probably go along with that so I will make that amendment if anybody would like to second it. The amendment is that around the environmental lands, we have a, a five-foot fence, something close to a five-foot fence. Or, or even if we could, a six-foot fence. It's going to be chain link. A fence that will discourage uh, teenagers from climbing over it. Well, I'm a, I know, I, Mr. I Mayor, teenagers are teenagers, but, but um, a, a fence that's under four feet is does not to me say these are lands we want to protect stay out of them it may be delineation so anyway i would make that amendment if anybody wants to second it and if not my comments will just stay on the record Councillor, I don't, I don't see a seconder um you'll second it um through you, Mr. Chair, I don't think that's going to cost a lot of extra money to anyone, and I think we have a responsibility to our environmental lands to do the very best we can for them. And uh, you know, why not send the message with a higher fence that we would like you to keep out of this property? I mean, we're we're here to protect the environment as well as our residents, so. Is there anyone else who'd be interested in speaking to this amendment? Councillor Tom. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, the lots that'll be backing onto the EP zone, those will actually back onto the tra proposed trail as well, right? So, you, Mr. so if the contention or is we want to keep Mr. people, Downey? oh, sorry, I, I, just, I saw nods. I, yeah, I, I'd just like you to speak with the microphone on. Uh, yes. Okay, You're correct, you. Councillor Tom. Councilor because Tom. we had this conversation when there was talk, I think it was around the Case Woodlot, the wood fences were deteriorating that were originally put in. They were, I think they were more aesthetic fences that delineated the property line. You could clearly go under them. And then we decided to replace them with chain link fencing. And I at the time said that's, I, I wasn't in favor of it because I thought, you know, uh, A, they're uglier and residents have to look at the chain link fence, but also, uh, there's there are going to be people walking through the trail system. I mean, Shepherd's Bush is an environmentally protected area, and we encourage people to go walk through there. Um, Crown lands all across the province. Um, some are EP, some probably aren't as well. There's no, nothing to say you can't go into Crown land and walk around through the, through the woods. So, uh, I, you know, I, I think people will create ways to get it through a fence, over a fence, if they want to. A four-foot chain link fence, to me, says, it. you know, don't come through. 
I don't know why we'd have to make them make it five feet high. I don't know why. You could make it 10 feet high. You could put barbed wire on the top if you wanted to, but I just, I don't get it. People will be walking on the trail system behind this fence anyways. They'll be accessing these lands, so, and walking through them. I don't get it. So I, I'm not in favor. I think what's there is fine. We'll, we'll go to Councillor Abel first, and then we'll come back to you, Councillor Gretner. Councillor Abel. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. There's a couple of things. I'm, I'm trying to learn from the maps where this fence would be uh, that uh, Councillor Gardner is talking about. Um, so if there's a quick f figure I could look at for the environmentally protected lands, is it the pet cemetery? Because it's not really spelled out pet cemetery anywhere. I believe it's page 19. Page 19, thank you. And in, on this one? Yes. Uh, Mr. Ramuno is going to help us out, I believe. And the pet cemetery? Oh, you're going to put it up overhead. That'd be great. Thank you, Mr. Ramuno. So, how many feet are we talking about? So, hold on, Mr. Ramuno, if you could just identify the area that we're speaking about right now. Move it down. That's it. Thank you. So the pet cemetery is is up here. Okay. In this area, and this this block here is the valley land that that has been conveyed to the town. The fence requirement um, again is a combination of what we're proposing as a four foot high chain link fence or a six foot high wood fence. And the wood fence, and I don't have, I can't read all the lot numbers here, but the wood fence would be uh, required. Uh, where there's a, a trail running behind the uh, behind the locks, and if I could just show you that this is the trail map here. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ruin. Now it's coming a bit clearer. So, so the dotted line is where our, the trail is uh, proposed. And the fence? And the fence. I, I have to confirm this, but I, I believe the fence behind these homes here would likely be a six-foot uh, wood fence. Uh, Similarly, down here, um, elsewhere, it would be the four-foot chain link fence. And could you just show me, for example, where you mean the four-foot? Is four, it the four-foot would likely be, you know, I would think in this area here. So behind the houses? Yeah, behind the, the rear yards. This this strip of lots, because there's a trail behind it, would likely have the six-foot uh, privacy fence. Similarly, here, here, mm -hmm. six-foot. Uh, wood fence, but in areas such as this, perhaps this area here, um, there would be a, a chain link fence. All right, so there's, I'm just, okay, so thank you very much. And the reason I, and I, the reason I uh, seconded this is because I kind of wanted to understand what the, the what it was. And again, if, uh, if I don't know if Councillor Gardner is asking, but if we could ask staff to come back with the effectiveness uh, putting a higher fence. I mean, would it really make a difference? If it doesn't, then I would not be in favor of it. If it does, if there's something that suggests it is effective, then I would like to know that, and then I could make my call on that if, and I'd like to know the cost on that as well. So I think there's a lot of things here that we don't know. First of all, where exactly, how much, and how effective they are. So before I make any decision, I would want that. I don't know if we can ask staff to do that but that's sort of why I'm sitting on this amendment. Um, if I don't see anything obvious. If I don't see anything obvious, then I'm not going to be in favor of this amendment. Council Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey, uh, do, do we not have a, a policy where uh, if a resident did want to add a gate to a chain link fence into an open space that they could just apply for it and could, could essentially get a gate? Mr. Downey? 
through you, we actually have a permit process. And uh, so um, that permit is, uh, uh, would be issued by the director um, and could be appealed to uh, council. Thank you, Mr. Johnny. So, so essentially, I mean, my, my point is, is that, is that a resident that has that chain link fence, whether it's six feet, four feet, five feet, 10 feet, as, as Councillor Tom mentioned, uh, uh, they could literally get a permit to put a gate in and still have access. So at the end of the day, uh, does it really matter what height it is? I think it's just to to differenti differentiate between their property and, and the open space. And I think that's all it's really doing. Um, at the end of the day, people can get in and out as they pretty much please. And I, I don't think we want to discourage people from necessarily just going into an open space and maybe just checking out nature within the town. Thank you. Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Mr. Downey. On the uh, the western portion of the land that's uh, abutting the CN Rail, uh, are, uh, are there any uh, uh, fencing or any kind of uh, uh, physical border there that uh, that's there for safety uh, measures currently? Mr. Downey, Th through you, as Chair, are you uh, between the railway tracks and uh, and the space? Yes. Yes. Yes, there is, um, and then. Um, there is a so, Mr. Downey, uh, pardon, yes. we'll just we'll stick to the amendment first which is whether or not we're going to extend the height of the fence <coughs> but the area you're talking about Councillor Kim will have a wooden fence I thought that was relevant in terms of uh, whether there's even a the fencing needed at all so uh, and a four foot fence wouldn't really if it was for safety measures on the west side it would really be ne negligible and which would uh, uh, encourage a higher fence. So that was the nature of my question. Thank you. Councilor Gartner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for clarification. So uh, a fence can go, somebody can apply for a permit to have a, a, a gate in their fence, and uh, that would be for open space zones and environmental protection zones. Mr. Downey. Through you, Mr. Chair, just for clarification purposes, it's not their fence. Right. Okay, it's the town's fence. Thank you. So that's why they need to apply for a permit. And it and it it applies even if it backs on to an environmental protection zone. Correct. Thank you. Uh, chances are we deny it, but then as I say, there is an appeal process before council. But uh, that's the reason we put the fence on the town property, so right. so they aren't they are uh, the so the fence does not belong to them, and they they would have to make modifications to a town-owned um, piece of infrastructure. Thank you. And as a follow-up, I think it was either at this council or the last one, there was quite a discussion about um, residents wanting to put gates in their fences, and we said no. So do we often uh, allow people to put gates in, our, in the town's fence? Mr. Downey? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, the fences that under our, were under discussion were not town fences. They, they were actually erected on the, town, on the resident's property. So they could put a gate on their fence. However, the moment they walked out of it, they would then be walking onto public lands. So that's where, that's where the, the, the confusion is. It, um, on all new developments, the fences are on town property. And so therefore, they need to ask permission to make that modification. Thank you. Seeing no other comments or questions on this amendment, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Those opposed? That fails to carry. Back to the main motion. I believe we had Councillor Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a quick question um, Mr. for Mr. Ramuno um, through you. Is uh, I tried to find it in the report and I couldn't, but I, are they providing parking for the trailhead? Mr. Ramono? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, we have a, uh, a condition um, where we're going to try uh, to work with the applicant to provide that trailhead parking for that future pet, for the pet cemetery. We haven't you know, identified a location, but there are a couple uh, options that we have. So we're going to continue to work with the applicant. Follow up? Certainly. Uh, will that get taken care of at the site plan? It will, it will, through you, Mr. Chair, it will be taken care of uh, prior to registration okay. of the final plans. Okay, thank you. Councillor Abel. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the pet cemetery, basic nothing is impacted with putting this in two phases. And in the report, there's talk of the butternut trees, the discovery of the butternut. Was that in the environmentally protected area? No. Or the pet cemetery? Mr. Ramono? Through you, Mr. Uh, Chair. No, the, the butternuts on site were not uh, in the vicinity of the pet cemetery. In and some of the other uh, environmental areas, and the applicant's been working with the uh, uh, the appropriate authorities uh, with respect to relocating some of those uh, elsewhere on site. Mr. Romano, your, your microphone wasn't on for Councilor Abel's first question. Sorry. So with regards to the pet cemetery, is that going to be impacted by the phasing? N no, uh, no, it will not Thank you. be impacted Council by the phasing. Councilor Abel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so there is a significance for the butternut tree. I guess that is, who am I asking that to, Mr. Chair? Uh, Mr. Downey, it looks like. <laughs> Mr. Ramuno? Could you just tell us what that is? So the, uh, as, as part of the application and the background uh, work that was done, there were some small butternut saplings that were uh, identified on the property and the applicant has been working uh, with the uh, don't recall if it's the actual uh, conservation authority or the uh, the MNR. That's right, the the MNR. Thank you uh, to ensure that those uh, are protected. And in some instances, they were relocated elsewhere on site. But they have. I think that has been solved with uh, with the MNR, and those button nuts have been protected, and they've received their. I think their final sign offs from the MNR. So there is something significant about the butternut species. <coughs> Yes, my understanding is that they are identified as a uh, significant species. That, okay, the ministry wants to protect. And so the, we've either transplanted or protected them, one or the other. That's correct. Oh, that's great. That's interesting to know. Thank you very much. Seeing no other comments or questions, all those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. We'll move back to item number R2. With regards to the space accommodation for 52 and 56 Victoria Street, uh, I'll be looking for someone to move the staff recommendation. Mayor Daw, will someone second the staff recommendation? No one is. Councillor Gartner? Comments or questions with regards to item number R2? Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the most part, I agree with it, but I do not agree um, with, <coughs> excuse me, sir, <coughs> uh, with support for the Faith Fellowship Baptist Church. So I would, I, for the Faith Fellowship Baptist Church, I would remove that from the in-kind support. Uh, so I would move that uh, amendment, Mr. Clerk, that we remove that. So, Mr. Mayor is moving a motion that we remove their additional in-kind support to the Faith Fellowship uh, Baptist Church. Uh, is there a seconder for that? Hmm? I don't see a seconder for that. Um, Mr. Mayor, would, any other comments, questions? Okay. Councillor Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question to staff is the increased budget amount for the operations of the um, senior center. If I, I think it's outlined in the report, that would be mitigated if we were f charging the full whack, correct? I think we'd actually net three grand or something. Mr. Downey? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. Um, the two in kind would then be combined, and we're talking 15500 and that would offset the $10,000 additional cost for part-time staff. Thank you. Um, you know, my only worry with this is, you know, what kind of a... What kind of a precedent do we set when we're looking to, you know, uh, enforce uh, permit fees for various town facilities? And 
I mean, it's hard once you begin to subsidize groups for space to then not subsidize other groups for space. And while this might seem an insignificant amount of money uh, comparative to the rest of our budget, what happens when a group of larger significance asks for subsidization for a variety of reasons? They want to inc improve services to their uh, their users, or you know, we you know we charge about a million bucks, I think, or just under about eight hundred thousand dollars to hockey for, for ice time. Now I know we might, you know what I mean. So like at at some point, we I just I worry about subsidizing space uh, or subsidizing groups for renting space. Um, you know, I know we've tried to do as much as we can for the groups uh, at these two properties, and and we're moving ahead. But uh, you know, I'm not in favor of um, I'm not in favor of, uh, of of this. So, I mean, I don't know. I guess the, if we still have to increase the budget for the senior center, I would I would move that if they're still interested in in renting these spaces. But um, so my question to staff is uh, similar to what I just asked: if we if I vote against two, I mean, we still have to increase the operating budget by 10 grand? If they're going to rent the space at full whack, they, we still have to increase the operating budget, correct? Or will that, in, will that income mitigate that? Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, we would still have to increase the budget by okay. 10,000 because we have to pay the staff. Yep. Um, we would then increase our revenues by the uh, the other amount and one would offset the right. average. Appreciate so I'll, uh, thank you, Mr. Downey. And Mr. Chair, I would just ask that um, we, we split this up when it comes to a vote. Sounds good. And Councillor Thompson. Thank you. You know, I have some concerns as well. I, you know, I think in general, the, the tenants at the, at the, uh, the building were on a month-to-month -month lease. They were well aware for many, many years that this was a temporary home for them and at some point they would have to move. And now we have a report in, for, in front of us that in some cases is advocating that we provide them with uh, an amount for a 10-year period. And so, you know, to me, I, I have trouble with the fact that we're subsidizing them for over such a long period of time given that uh, they were on a month-to-month -month lease. Um, and so, uh, you know, a short-term period, I, I'm happy to discuss, but, you know, for it to be year after year for up to 10 years, I can't support that. Further, to, me, to my knowledge, uh, in the case of the Air Cadets, they only have a three-year lease. Mr. Downey, can you confirm that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's correct. It's a three-year lease. And I guess philosophically, I, I have a trouble saying that we're going to give you a rent subsidy for a 10-year period when you only have a three-year lease in front of you. If it would have been three years and then come back and reconsider it, depending on where they end up or how that's all going to work, so be it. But just the way the report is now, I, I, I can't support it. Thank you. Councillor Kim. I think, um, I think in principle, I mean, as the gatekeepers of the town's finances, you know, we, we can't, I, I treat this, I treat town's funds as it is, as if it were my own. And if I could give out, I, I would give out as, as much as I can, but that would be, my decision based on my money. Knowing that there are, you know, 63,000 people and uh, maybe 20,000 households, and uh, we're looking after their <coughs> contributions to the public purse, I, I don't think in good conscience I could uh, subsidize other stakeholders or other uh, third party uh, organizations uh, in town property. Uh, I, mean, I, I agree with. Uh, Councillor Tom and Councillor Thompson, uh, principally, uh, I, I would prefer that we treat all these organizations as one. I, I don't want to separate them out because then uh, it would seem like we, we are favoring one over the other, but essentially, you know, uh, they all provide some level of uh, contributions to society and to our town. I'm sure of that, but if they're that... Uh, Noteworthy, and I'm, I'm sure they are. Then, then th th there are other sources that uh, they're going to have to try to uh, leverage. And so, uh, so my my preference is to you know leave them as one, uh, and and not separate them uh, from voting perspective. And I understand uh, Councillor Tom's viewpoint, though. And my view is, 
you know, uh, I'm open to having uh, some transition time to give them, although they've known this for, for a long time. They maybe some, some people are in denial, uh, maybe a limited transition time, but uh, certainly uh, not an indefinite long term. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And I'll, I'll let Councillor Tom clarify, but it's my understanding that he wanted items one, two, and three pulled separately, not the individual user groups pulled separately. Okay, sounds good. Councillor Abel? <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, you know, myself, I, I recall the cultural precinct recommending that the armory be used for the air cadets. Uh, to me, it makes perfect sense. Of course, we all know that we can't use the armory because uh, that is a matter of an agreement that's taking place in a closed session. Uh, we have scarce resources. Uh, my question through you, Mr. Chair, is why is all this being put on the Senior Centre and have you contacted the Senior Centre to ask the impact that all these programs might have? Mr. Downey. Through you, Mr. Chair, the agreement that we have with the Senior Centre is that uh, priority for the spaces are given to the Seniors Association. Um, we have gone through the bookings of these uh, rooms by the Seniors Association and maintained that priority. Um, so there are exceptions uh, to the permits uh, um, uh, potentially issued to the Bridge Club and Faith Fellowship Church, um, uh, but essentially the rooms uh, are substantially uh, vacant on Sunday and available for permitted use, uh, which is uh, within the right of the municipality to permit. So is, is the answer no, you did not consul consult with the senior center? Th through Mr. you, Danny? through you, Mr. Chair, no, uh, we didn't talk Thank to you. the seniors. All right, I just, I just thought that would be, because um, I don't recall it coming through. On, um, the. Um, I mean, there is programming space available at the uh, Family Leisure Complex. Um, I, I mean, <clears throat> I know that the Seniors Center is looking for expansion and looking for expansion on their programs. And I thought, um, uh, Mr. Downey, you have regular meetings with the board that this would be something that would have come up uh, for discussion. Uh, with them at the time before this report came through. So uh, I think there's going to be an impact on this on the senior center. Um, I do recall um, with um, open public forum on the, uh, on the library square, the people that mostly talked were people that were looking for program space and identified were the Bridge Club and, and other groups, scouts, and on all those that were saying, whatever you do with the library square, we would like to see programming space for this available. <clears throat> and of course, uh, anything on the short term is good, and I, and I think we may have uh, led them to believe that we were going to provide them that space when we asked to engage. Uh, right now, we're sort of in a limbo situation. Um, the uh, Aurora Bridge Club has already left. They're in Newmarket. That's 240 abled um, seniors that travel and shop. Um, that have left our, our downtown core and they were there five days a week and that's a tremendous loss to our uh, activities and economics and everything that uh, we try and attain and uh, these are sort of um, I feel like it's sort of a nomadic situation we've left our um, clubs in <clears throat> so we're, the message I'm getting uh, Mr. Chair is that uh, uh, some people are very stable in, in the, what the town does and, and subsidizes, and, and I think Councillor Tom brought forward, like we do this for hockey and, and sports, and there's probably many other things we do subsidize for. Uh, we can't do it for everybody, um, but you know, long-standing clubs like the Cadets and Bridge Club should be given the same sort of treatment as, as other groups and organizations. I feel, I feel bad. I feel this is going to be an imposition on the senior center. I would like this to go to them for their comments uh, before anything gets resolved. And I'd also like us to uh, to consider uh, the role that the armory could play for the air cadet. Uh, I mean, it, it, to me, it just makes so much sense. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Downey. I, I don't believe I got a full answer. Um, Councillor Abel asked you if you had consulted the, the seniors uh, center in any capacity and 
Uh, I, I didn't hear a full answer from you. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, the Senior Association has not been consulted. Um, it would not be our practice to consult them. Uh, permitting of that facility is a municipal function. Um, and um, there's an agreement that uh, those rooms can be permitted by the municipality. Um, uh, there are areas within the senior um, facility that are not permitted by the, by the municipality, and so those are full discretion of the seniors. These, these rooms that we are permitting are not, and so it is well within the town's purview to permit these rooms, and we, are, we don't seek the permission of the association um, or communicate with the association if we decide we're going to permit those rooms for whatever function. And I'll just remind everyone around the table that uh, all questions to staff uh, go through the chair, and it's not appropriate to be cutting off a staff member while they're trying to answer a question. Uh, Councillor Tom? Um, yeah, just wanted to clarify. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Abel said I was advocating for subsidizing uh, hockey, or I brought forward that. I was merely mentioning that if we subsidize groups that are requesting a smaller amount of money, we have groups that are have a much larger interest in and pay a lot more money for service fees. And I thought I just brought it up that, you know, if, if you were going to be consistent, then when they come knocking, you'd be in a much more of a different financial situation. So I wasn't advocating for it. Councillor Abel mentioned I was. I wasn't. You clear? No, no. You you said you were advocating for subsidizing. Just wanted to clear that up. Seeing no other comments or questions, um, I will call these separately. Um, all in favor of the first clause, which is to receive the report. Any opposed? That is carried. We'll move on to the second clause, which I believe is, is the clause to provide subsidization to these groups. Just give it a second. All those in favor of the second clause, as it's written in the board. All those opposed, that clause fails to carry. And then last but not least, the increase of $10,000 to be able to staff during these additional times. All those in favor? All those opposed? So that fails to carry. We'll move on to item number R3. Would anyone like to move the staff recommendation? Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Mr. Mayor Daw. Um, would anyone like to speak to this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. We are now on to item number R5, Summary of a Committee Recommendations Report. Would anyone like to move the staff recommendation? Moved by Councillor Tom, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Any comments or questions? Councillor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I threw you to Mr. Ramuno. Mr. Ramuno, they're asking for um, to identify to identify uh, listed designated uh, properties. Is am I on the correct one, right? Yes, uh, listed designated properties uh, along the Young Street corridor. I'm just wondering, could th could those not be identified through that uh, the map that we currently have, or are we looking for? Or is the is the committee looking for something more than what we already have? Mr. Muno. Certainly through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and we had a discussion at our Heritage Committee last night as well. So uh, uh, the request was to provide a, a, a more detailed listing. And we do have a map that identifies uh, those designated and uh, listed properties uh, throughout town. But we're going to provide a, uh, a more detailed um, a list which, which provided some background information with respect to 
um, the history of the individual properties for account for the committee's consideration uh, uh, over the next meeting or two, either November or December. Okay, thank you, Mr. Romano. I just wanted that cleared up because I, uh, to me, the way I read it, I, I thought that the the one that actually what they were actually looking for was the potential historic property, potentially historic properties within the area and, and for that history report. But because for me, we already have which properties are listed and which properties are designated. So that's, I just wanted to clarify that. So thank you very much. Seeing no other comments or, or questions, all those in favor, any opposed, that's carried. We'll move on to the added item number R6, uh, Animal Shelter Services, Memorandum of Understanding. Would somebody like to move the staff recommendation? Councillor Kim, seconded by Mayor Daw. Any comments or questions about this item? Councillor Gartner, did you did you click and unclick, or do you not want to speak? You do want to speak, Councillor Gartner. I do want to speak. Um, so I I guess um, this might this was under Ms. Van Leeuwen, so you're you're here representing her. Oh, thank you. Um, so the first R six is the shelter services and. Um, And I, I might have to make these comments next week, but it, there's no anywhere in here. There's no mention of of taking care of the animals. It's all about finance and um, you know making it easier for us joining a group. Uh, so uh, and under financial implications, page four, there was wording that caught my attention. The remaining 40% are variable costs, including medical supplies, animal food, veterinary services, disposal of animals. So uh, if uh, you are able to take this on Ms. Van Leeuwen's behalf, um, do we know that the, do we know what services are being, um, do we know how the animals are being treated and, and have there been any problems? Ms. Hedy? Through you, Mr. Chair, I have uh, some uh, good knowledge of this p particular facility. Uh, I have toured it on five separate occasions since my arrival here in 2015. They're an approved, provincially approved facility um, that uh, I believe uh, does a wonderful job of caring for animals as well as adopting them out. Um, I've been on scheduled visits and unscheduled visits and found it to be clean and well run. Thank you, I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you. I'm done. Seeing no other comments or questions, all those in favor, any opposed, that is carried. Last but not least on the uh, regular agenda, item number R7, Animal Control Services. Would anyone like to move the staff recommendation? Moved by Mayor Daw, seconded by Council Maracas. Any comments or questions? Seeing, oh, Councilor Gartner. Um, I believe in here, uh, well, we are talking about cost savings, um, but um, animal control is, is a very difficult business. And, uh, but I do believe in here there, there was mention that we would have, by going this model, we would have better success with the animal licenses. Ms. Eddy? Through you, Mr. Chair, the animal licensing is uh, taken care of by our uh, contracted service DocuPet, and there are some provisions uh, for the next several months just uh, to help out with that um, to increase pet licensing. Uh, 
So that's separate from this entirely. This is specific to uh, animal control and uh, enforcement. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, why do you think this will be more successful for us, ap apart from um, the money, which is always important? Um, how is this going to improve the aspect of the business, our business? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, there's a number of significant reasons for taking animal control in-house. Accountability would be one, responsiveness in a timely manner to the residents would be another, collaboration with the team would be another. We've begun preparations already uh, with officers to support any endeavors we have with animal control because we believe it's important to the public. Uh, we've made strides in making um, better enforcement through the trail systems and bringing it in-house would uh, bring the accountability into the office. We'd be better informed, better communication, all round. I ran uh, animal control through two other municipalities and it was uh, something where uh, the accountability stayed at home. And so we were able to really manage things according to what residents' requirements were. Thank you, I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, you, through you, Mr. Chair, I'm glad to hear that you've had experience with this because it is uh, it is very difficult. Um, you do mention on page three uh, more flexibility to respond to community needs through cross training. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we have already got uh, several officers on board who have been trained as animal control officers before they came to the town of Aurora. Additionally, we've provided uh, extra training for some of our part-time and other full-time officers so that they can support an animal control officer. And it also covers us for vacations, sick time, uh, holidays, uh, after hours. So it gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of providing services. Thank you. And uh, how are we going to create a dog-friendly community? Ms. Eddie? That's a really big question. I think first uh, and foremost, we listen to the residents and what they require or are wanting. We, there's always two sides to that story. There's the dog owners and there's the people who don't have dogs. And I think we have to be sensitive to both sides of those, um, that, uh, those arguments. And uh, I think education is the very first step and uh, um, I'm, like I said, I think we have to just listen to the residents and be very responsive to them. Thank you. Perhaps I can speak to you afterwards about that. Uh, the last one has to do with uh, monitoring the trails. We, we have had issues with dogs off leash on the trails. Um, and we added, I believe, ha I was going to say half a person, but we, we did add some hours in the last budget. So um, can you see how all of this would be helping us on the trails? Ms. Eddie? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, in addition to uh, having an officer in an animal c control truck, we did last year, in 2016, uh, obtain a bicycle and train an officer for uh, traveling the trails, which is what we had done in a, another municipality. It was very successful. Uh, the plan is to have officers partner up uh, second with a second bicycle and uh, do more monitoring the trails, especially in the summer months. Thank you, and uh, I have a feeling, although it's Tasha's report, you've done a lot of work on this. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Marakis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Three to Mandy. Mandy, uh, would this also include uh, uh, dealing with wildlife calls? Through you, Mr. Chair. Currently, our wildlife response is for public lands uh, in the injured uh, wildlife. 
we would be responding to that in the same fashion as we do now, only we would just be using a contracted service as opposed to uh, a call out. Uh, any other um, wildlife as similar to any other municipality if it's on private property it's the responsibility of a private uh, homeowner okay, thank you um, you know just looking through the report I, I to me what sticks out is the is the uh, sixty thousand uh, dollars approximate sixty thousand dollars in savings uh, to the operating costs uh, and so to me that's a direct savings on the tax rate to the residents um, and we're going to be from what I'm hearing is providing a better service for the residents and so on. we say time and time again our job is to look at ways to provide a better service for the same or less money and and that's what I think uh, staff have done here and they found that efficiency within this service and we're going to be providing that better service to our residents so uh, I thank uh, staff for all the hard work on this so thank you very much I might have some more questions next week but I'll leave it at that for today Councilor Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, along the same lines, um, the uh, the staff control, the animal control officer position, uh, and the overall change is uh, indicated in the financial implications to be a savings of sixty thousand dollars. But at our at our recent financial advisory committee meeting, the animal uh, control officer position was presented as cost neutral. So I just want to get some clarification about that, if I could. Eddie? I'm going to defer that to uh, Mr. Elliott. Um, we've got a number of uh, different um, options that we were looking at, but I'll, I'll leave that to Mr. Elliott to clear up. Mr. Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to the councillor. The, uh, the animal control position is to be funded with the savings on the animal shelter contract. So when we when we change the contract to Georgina from SPCA, which also included uh, the animal uh, control service, we save money there, and that savings exceeds the cost of the new person to do animal control for a net savings of nearly $60,000. Great, I appreciate the clarification. And that's what it reads like to me, but I just wanted to go circle back to it because sometimes when I read cost neutral, it makes me think that that savings offsets the cost of hiring the person. So, thank you. Seeing no other comments or questions. Although, Councilor Gartner. As I've been at this table when this has been discussed many times, and uh, it's always been a very difficult discussion with uh, no easy answers and there's obviously been a lot of work done on this so I would really like to thank staff for that because uh, they've made it very easy for us it could have been otherwise <laughs> I think that's echoed by everyone around the table um, so uh, all those in favor anyone contrary minded that carries uh, we'll now move on to new business. We'll start with uh, the mayor. Nothing for you. Councillor Kim? No. Councillor Tom? Councillor Abel? Thompson? The floor is yours. Uh, I'm going to direct this one to our, our communications manager. Once again, I see that our electronic board sign at uh, Orchard Heights and Young Street is once again out of commission. We, we bring it up frequently. We've heard over the last two years uh, a number of reasons for the continual failures. Are we going to replace this? And if not, you know, uh, what are we doing about it? Ms. Mackenzie Smith. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, um, the sign board is actually um, not technically a corporate communications responsibility. Um, it is actually, <laughs> and I'm not, is actually under. Um, uh, uh, yes, under Mr. Catania, um, under facilities, but um, I can say that uh, we have had numerous conversations, obviously, um, about it, and I'm not sure if Mr. Downey perhaps has more information on uh, the most recent update on what is happening with the sign. Mr. Downey, what's the story? Through uh, you, Mr. Chair, um, we are looking at replacing both that and the one at the SARC. Both have operational issues that we need to repair that needs to be more um, certainty in it working on a regular basis so we have done 
everything we possibly could to try to make sure that uh, it's up and operational and uh, and stays that way but we have not been successful so i have been in communications with staff and and we're putting forward a cost to not only deal with that one but the one at the sark as well because we're having some issues with that thank you mr downey and i know uh, when we had our saturday capital budget meeting and there was the the byline about the sarks i had meant to bring it up at the end of the day with regards to this sign because uh, i would like to see us do something i know Many of us have had an opportunity at the conferences we go to see some of the advancements that are done out there. And at the end of the day, I just would like to see a working sign. So if we need to add it to the capital budget, then so be it. Thank you. Councillor Kirtner. Nothing. Councillor Marakis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will direct this to uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's a Lake Simcoe question. Uh, as the chair, I'm just curious. We've we've had some questions. I've had some questions from residents as far as the uh, uh, the low levels of water in the Mackenzie Marsh. I'm just wondering if there is any reasoning for that. Uh, has there been any conversations at Lake Simcoe about the low level, the low level of water in the Mackenzie Marsh? What Mackenzie Marsh? Marsh? Um, that um. um Yes, I'm just trying to, because I, I saw an email exchange about a month ago on that. Uh, the Mackenzie Marsh is a private facility, uh, and the water flow through it is controlled by the owner of the property. And that was, that was actually a response from the, uh, from the authority. All right. Um, there's no closed session for this uh, committee meeting. Uh, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Um, did I skip something, Councillor? There's no public service announcements. No. Okay. Thanks. Certainly, Councillor Gartner. <laughs> you got to press. Mr. Ned Rosny. Nita Rosny. Uh, so we did our redid our procedural bylaw uh, about a year ago, and I believe that we're going to be. The intent was to have another look at it about a year later to see uh, how satisfied we are with it. Is that on your radar, and when might it be coming? Councillor Gartner, have you had your opportunity for your one-on-one -on -one with uh, Mr. Nadarosny? Friday. You will learn all about uh, changes to <laughs> <laughs> I shall wait. Uh, did you want to add anything? No, no okay. Sounds good. Oh, that is, uh, <laughs> uh, Councillor Tom is moving adjournment. Seconded by Councillor Thompson. Comments, questions on the adjournment? Seeing none. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much, everyone. Good time. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.